in every fated journey in life, hardly is there anyone who hasn't gone through a peculiar situation as they move forward in life. God becomes the key factor for a victory in every situation. Faith is a necessity or criteria for one to surpass limitations for God to act. Life is a desperate struggle against depression, anger, pain, and sadness without faith. The faith to believe in one higher than yourself. The faith to hold on to a reality that you just cannot see. Hoping desperately to make sense of all the chaos, disappointments, sickness, war, hard times, and pain in this world. Hoping that all this life is not just a random mix of complex details, but that we are all in the hands of God who is in the place of control. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Most believers want to see before they believe. This is indeed itself an error, and it is abnormal by Scripture's template and the principles of God. Note that the things of the Spirit are quite different from the things of the physical. Every word spoken by God is built on principles that ought to change our lives. The requirement of faith is that you are meant to believe even when it seems impossible to accomplish. Faith is praying, saying, and believing God's word for you into reality. Faith is holding on dearly to everything God has said about you and to you in his word, choosing to believe that instead of what you see in the physical. To put it simply, to decide to go the way of faith is to walk in absolute defiance of common sense and the norm of reality and societal standards. Matthew 14, verse 31 says, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? The scripture talks about how Peter summoned up courage answering the call of Jesus to come meet him out on the water. Obviously, Peter started to walk on the water, but after a few moments, Peter began to doubt. So he started sinking until Jesus walked up to him and helped him stand firmly. What is required of us at all times, regardless of the situation, is for us to have faith. In order for us to move through life in various stages, we are required to have faith to move mountains. Jesus has reached out to you right now. He has beckoned on you to come. He is asking us to step on that road of uncertainties, walk despite the pain in our bodies right now, and go for that interview with a different attitude. Reach out to the long lost family who seems to be impossible to reconnect with. Choose to believe in more than what your effort and attempt can produce. Choose to believe in God, in his word and his promises, and dare to walk on the impossible. A profound example of a person in the Bible whose faith served as a model to all believers in Christ is the man Abraham. Abraham is known as the father of faith. He is a model who has stirred the heart of so many believers into understanding the profound attitude of faith. Hallelujah! So excited to announce that exercising your faith is reforging your fate. Abraham, all through his life, consistently exercised his faith. His faith brought him into a new era of riches, generational blessings, and eternal legacy. This is the benefits we all enjoy now as believers in Christ. Abraham, through obedience by faith, was bestowed the heritage of kingship, spiritual authority, power, and so on, we as believers ought to follow after the footsteps of the man called Abraham, which means a man of faith is backed up by power. Power is only released to assist those who will dare to step out in faith against all odds. Abraham stepped out despite the uncertainties of trusting God. He dared to go on the journey to the promised land even when 
God did not tell him everything about the journey. When God promised him a child, he dared to believe God even when his natural body has long ceased the childbearing capability. His wife has long passed the age of childbirth and delivery, yet he held on stubbornly to faith. In defiance of the reality that confronted him, he foolishly chose to keep his faith in God. God did not let him down. For the power to bring this long-awaited promise to pass was released and received that promise according to what God had told him. The scriptures emphasize how important faith is and why we as believers should process it while believing in God. Sometimes we walk around carrying mountain loads of burdens that hinder us from reaching our goals in life. This brings about doubt in believing and trusting in God. It is not enough to just hope that things will change someday as you keep holding on. It is crucial that you invest your absolute trust and belief in no one else but God. The problems arising are absolutely normal, for they are here to pass our faith through the fire of tribulations to bring the truth of whom and in what we truly believe to the surface. Every man will be tested according to the ability put in him by God. Every situation in life, no matter how troublesome it may be, which confronts us require our total faith in Christ. In Hebrews 11 verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed out seven days. The children of Israel were faced with overcoming Jericho because this was the part of the inheritance God had promised them. May I clarify that if the children of Israel were without faith and timid to follow the instructions of God concerning the fall and infiltration of Jericho, then they would have been stopped dead in their tracks and unable to claim their inheritance. A good example also is the situation of the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. But by faith, they were able to pass through the Red Sea on dry land while the Egyptians were drowned. Consequently, we should understand that without faith, nothing would work out well. Believers most times have had a great deal of persistent or reoccurring issues that have plundered their health, families, marriages, and so many more, all leading to faithless life which has produced no good results and carefree believers. I admonish you to not live a faithless life, but a life full of obedience to God's word and faith balanced life. Because when you do this, God can do all that you desire. So choose to believe that God will show up for your broken or breaking marriage. Choose to believe that his word concerning your children to make them a success on earth will come to pass instead. They will not end up rebels and without a future. Choose to believe that your health is not a foregone issue, no matter how bad the enemy has painted things to look. Decide today to walk in absolute faith in God's ability to turn things around in your favor according to his word that lines will fall into you in pleasant places, that this season of trial, failure, heartbreak, and pain will not be the end of you. It is not enough for you to have faith alone, but acting and continuous improvement on your faith by listening to the experience of other notable ministers in faith and regarding the Word of God with understanding through the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Obedience to the Word of God is a show in exercising faith. What is the essence of a man who rightly knows the Word and yet he refuses to obey the Word by acting on it? It becomes unfruitful no matter the efforts he or she puts into the work. God's desire for man is to excel no matter the mountain placed before him. The scripture encourages total obedience of man towards the precept of God. Through this, faith comes alive in every single word a man speaks. So go out there in search of the best counsel for your life, the counsel of God through his word. Contained within the Bible is his plan for you and your family. What you do not know is yours may remain a dream for as long as you are ignorant.
Step out today to experience and know God's plan for you through His Word, the Bible. And existing an essential benefit of faith is having access to grace through faith. We need faith to move mountains. This becomes a major milestone for every believer in Christ. For one to have faith, he or she has gotten access to grace. Grace qualifies the unqualified. It means that for a believer to be qualified, to get a thing which he or she is undeserving of, such believer needs faith. By right as believers in Christ, we have been given the grace to do the things we ordinarily can't do. But by virtue of faith in God, we have been granted grace to break through boundaries and obstacles. You break boundaries and cross limitations with your faith when grace is released from God. God makes grace abundant to the weak and especially to those who are aware that they are weak and know that by their own strength they can do nothing. This prompts them to ask help from God. To such a person, abundant grace is released to assist the faith of such a person. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. For every faith to move a mountain, such faith must draw its total source from God. Do note that it must be a total. God refuses to share his glory with any man. Believers in Christ have made little mistakes that have amounted to grave disruption in their lives. They have placed their faith in the wisdom of men. Heartbreaking situations overwhelm believers when they have unconsciously begun to believe in the power of man. It is God who uses the avenue of man to help and deliver people from all manner of problems and sticky situations. Sadly, we do not know this and end up making a God out of our helper and forgetting that he was only used by God to be of assistance to us at that time. God has the power to save us from such situations, but he stops when we no longer place our trust in him. Placing your faith in God assures you of an absolute victory. Finally, the scriptures say in Romans 10 verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Brethren, hearing the word of God over and over again produces faith. Just imagine that you are faithful to do your workout all the time. Then the main aim for the workout becomes realizable because you have been consistent. Achieving a strong faith in God is a realization of inconsistency in hearing the word of God. This improves your foundation and conviction in what you believe. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Brethren of God, it is promised that he can't fail. God needs us to have faith in order for him to show how mighty he is. God is able to do all that he has promised to do, no matter how it seems impossible in the wisdom of men. God will always step into our issues if we can just trust in Him. God is in control at all times. Do you believe that's true today? Perhaps it's difficult for you to perceive His strength since life is filled with storms that surge and threaten whatever you hold so dear. If such is the case, a home built on the rock, God, is safe. Perhaps you're having problems defining in control. Maybe you don't want to be subjected to His authority. Others may have exploited their power, and you vow never to submit to anybody again. Whether we like it or not, His omnipotence is a truth. What is the definition of control? The phrases authority, subjection, sovereignty, power, dominance, and restriction spring to mind. God's people are frequently engaged in conflict, whether with flesh and blood authorities or with heavenly realms. He is the leader of an army, and God's people are his troops, over whom he has power. God not only directs, 
but also protects his people, taking full responsibility for them. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41, 10. God knows everything there is to know about us. He is aware of our worries and anxieties. He's well aware that we're all human. Despite this, God often reminds us not to be afraid. Fearlessness entails trusting God rather than feeling our current predicament is larger than God. God wants us to put our faith in Him, to have faith that He will always be enough. When we have fears, we must remember that God is not disappointed in us. God is well aware of our apprehensive nature, and He is concerned about all of our fears. Fear is something that God does not want us to be consumed with. Our anxieties, on the other hand, do not surprise Him in the least. For those who trust in the Lord's Word, the Lord's instructions are not difficult or tiresome. For those who are called by His name, God's commandments are neither unattainable nor unreasonable. Joshua was summoned and told to be brave and powerful, and so are you. He was to get his power from the Lord God and not from his own might or intellect, and so are you. Joshua and the Israelites would have failed if they tried to conquer the Promised Land with their own courage and power. Instead, they put their faith in the Lord their God, who had vowed to be with them everywhere they went. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9 You too are to immerse yourself in God's Word. Reflect on God's promises. Believe in the reality of God's Word. Obey God's commands that have been given to us via Scripture, knowing that God is with you and the Almighty is your strength. In our vulnerability, His strength is made perfect. The promise that the all-powerful God is our only source of strength and refuge is as valid today as it was in Joshua's day. God promises to be with us in every hardship and trouble we face just as he was with Joshua when he gave him the mandate. He makes promises and ever keeps them. Anxiety and panic are constant human companions. These are two of the enemy's most often used weapons against us. Fear left unchecked can keep you in bed for hours longer than is healthy or prudent. Anxiety can manifest itself as a raging rage, rude remarks, and unpleasant attitudes. The longer you fight fear, the more likely you are to get overpowered by it, enabling it to dictate your every action and choice. Even yet, we have the assurance that God is reliable and He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your capabilities, which includes the sinful unbelief of a worried heart. God has the last say. It's up to Him. Psalm 46, 1-7 introduces the theme of trust in God. God is our refuge and strength, a helper who is always found in times of trouble. Quit trying to control everything and make God your sanctuary and implore Him for the strength you'll need each minute of the day. God is with us. He is always there and He is our ally. A refuge is, by definition, a safe haven when the Bible says that God is our shelter, it means that when we need protection from something, God is our safe haven. Knowing that God is our refuge allows us to put our confidence in Him with more ease. We don't have to be afraid of events or individuals who endanger our bodily or spiritual well-being. There is no scenario we will ever encounter that is beyond God's control. Therefore, being right with Him is the finest place to be at all times. God is our Redeemer. The term Redeemer connotes power, might, boldness, and mightiness. 
when we face difficulties and tribulations, our strength is sapped. However, God is able to strengthen us and assist us in standing. All we have to do is beg for His help. As followers of Jesus, we serve a God who is unfazed by the challenges we confront on a daily basis. God is sovereign. Thus, He is well versed in panic, pandemics, turmoil, and perplexity. And no matter what we encounter, He is beside us. God has also provided us His Word, which we may go to whenever we need to be reminded of His presence. And we discover this promise in Psalm 18, too, in His Word. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. When life gets too much for you, where do you go? Some people's rock is a person, such as their mother, father, or closest friend. Others use it as a particular spot to go when they feel lost and alone, or when life becomes too much for them. Others seek solace in amusement or a heavy drink. David had grown to believe that God was the greatest and only place for consolation, refuge, strength, and refreshment in the darkest hour. With outstretched arms, Jesus invites us to rest in His presence. All you who are tired and burdened, come to me, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11, 28. Come to me is the first thing Jesus says to us. We are free to approach God directly. There is no barrier between us and Him. Second, He extends an invitation to us. Jesus wants you so much that He willingly died on the cross to demonstrate His love for you. Jesus did not have to come to our world and die, but God's love for us is so tremendous that He chose to do so. Third, God explains to us who requires rest. It's those who toil and are burdened. But what does this imply? Individuals who labor in this sense refer to those who are attempting to accomplish everything on their own and failing. When we strive to do everything in life just in our own power, it rarely works out. When you are heavy laden, it feels as though your soul, intellect, will, and emotions are unable to operate because you are carrying a burden that you are attempting to lighten on your own. It makes you feel unhappy, depressed, worried, and all other unpleasant emotions we don't want to experience in life. So, when we are tired, what does God say to us? He promises to give us rest, and the greatest part is that He even tells us how to get it, by taking on His yoke and learning from Him. I'm not sure what this yoke is for you. Your soul requires rest, your mind, will, and emotions. It takes time and effort to learn how to rest in God. It's similar to an onion. You believe you've gotten to the bottom of a layer and discovered what God's rest is like, only to realize there's still more to explore, learn, and enjoy. It's a lifelong adventure that, if you allow it, will only become better and better. Today, Ask God what the first modest step is for you to do to find God's rest, and then do what He says. We want for a rest we can't offer ourselves, for gentleness in a yoke found only in Jesus, one that is simple, where the weight is light and the rest is forever. Jesus presents Himself to the actual us, not some distant incarnation of ourselves, not some spruced up version of ourselves, but the genuine us. Weary, mournful, depressed, anxious, failing, sinful. We come to Him as we are, with no pretense, with nothing in our hands to offer but need, asking Him to turn our desire 
into reality, to turn our grief into pleasure, to remove the shame of sin by His blood, and to provide new life for those who are on the verge of death. We were created to be in the presence of God. As a result, when we come to Jesus and take up His yoke, we discover the type of life we desire. He becomes not only mine or your rescuer, but our Savior as well. He unites us and begins to utilize us for His own glory. For His sake, we begin to get involved in activities we could never have imagined before. He demonstrates how we should live for Him. He not only carries the weight, but He also sends us on a mission he sends His harvest-ready fields out into the world to accomplish His work. He is a patient person. He's sensitive. He's willing to talk. He is willing to work with you. He's considerate. He pulls us up when we fall. This is how powerful and in control God is in our lives. We require a level of control that goes beyond what we have now. We require everlasting rest. We need to know that we won't be able to undo this at a later date. We require inner peace, permanent harmony with God. A clean conscience is required. We require the eradication of guilt. We require the eradication of shame. And Jesus provides it all through His life, death, and resurrection. Right now, his salvation is comprehensive and complete for us. One of the most prominent reasons for individuals rejecting Christianity is the belief in miracles. People don't think these can happen. Thus, they argue that the other sections of the Bible and biblical accounts are false. Christians have been taught to believe in the Bible's miracles. But is this really logical? God is a sophisticated God who communicates in ways that are beyond our comprehension. Miracles are God's divine involvement in delivering a message to His people. Whether it's a volcano erupting or a cancer patient recuperating, miracles occur frequently and always for a reason. God sends a message to someone when He performs a miracle. In our connection with God, faith is a necessary component you can tell a mountain to leap into the sea if you have confidence, Jesus says. He also instilled in them the importance of asking in His name and praying in line with God's desire. Another way He expresses it is if they stay with Him or abide with Him, they may ask for anything and it will be fulfilled. It's incredible that we may approach God via Christ and that He allows us to beg for things. It's also a marvelous mystery that the universe's sovereign God has decreed that part of His will be carried out through our prayers. Mark 11, 24 Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. God instills dreams in our hearts and the signs of fate to our life. And if we put our faith in Him enough to believe what He says, we'll be on our way to realizing that goal. Unfortunately, the route to the promise is invariably thicket-lined and thorn-infested. Nothing worthwhile ever arrives without difficulty or opposition. Storms will rage, lions will roar, and we shall face our anxieties. God causes the journey to be rough in order to refine us and prepare us for our promised land. He is hell-bent on obtaining information from us that our adversary would love to use against us. He desires to accomplish exceedingly above and beyond all that we could ever ask or conceive, according to Ephesians 3.20. But there's a clincher in this verse. Due to His work inside us, He will only be able to achieve great things through us to the extent that He's permitted to operate in us. As we follow His path, we shall find ourselves in a valley, a valley of choosing at various times. There, marriages perish. Dreams perish there as well. The body is hard to kill, and sadly for many, they've chosen to let their dream die before confronting their flesh. We should always seek God's guidance in our religious journey 
so that we do not lose hope before we receive the ultimate prize. Ephesians 3, 20 to 21. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. Do you find yourself concerned and worried about current or possible difficulties all the time? Do you have concerns about your future, your job, your finances, your friends and family, your health and your death? A constant concern may have a harmful impact on our emotional, bodily, and spiritual well-being. As a Christian, it's critical to understand how to quit worrying about everything and start trusting God's miracles in our life. Worrying may have a negative impact on your emotional, spiritual, and physical health. It can also have a detrimental impact on your relationships since it alters the way you speak, act, and react to events. If you've previously prayed to God, know that He will respond in His own time. Learn to patiently await His promises. Worry has no place in your heart when you begin to realize the marvels that God has performed. When concern dominates you, Offering gratitude to God can help. When you sit down and reflect on how God has helped you get through some difficult situations, you'll often be surprised at how well you've done. I've been in near-fatal vehicle accidents, suffered from a life-threatening condition as a youngster, and had family members who were so sick that I was worried for their lives. The list goes on and on. But thanks to God's miracles, grace, and love, I'm still here, alive and well. Everyone has a story to tell, and we've all had circumstances in which we've clearly seen God's hand at work. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6-7 The Bible is a living and vibrant book. It's still applicable today in terms of assisting us in facing and dealing with life's issues. God's Word can assist you in reducing your anxiety and tension levels. God is frequently preparing us for something we've asked for, but we can't see the wider picture due to our lack of confidence. If you can't pray about something but immediately start worrying about it, what's the point of praying? You must have faith in God to fix the problem for you. Hold on to your hope and never lose trust in your miracle. Faith, Jesus tells us, can move mountains. Such trust is what we should aim towards. Do you feel as though time has stopped for you? Does it feel as though nothing changes day after day and that God has forgotten all about you? He hasn't forgotten about you. He's merely taking the time to get you ready for a certain assignment or an upcoming opportunity. In the season of development, God's methods include preparation, obedience, and service. We may believe that we are prepared for anything since we don't always grasp God's methods. We've been studying the Bible. We've been praying for a long time. We've been listening to excellent instruction. What else are we supposed to do? While we're going through the preparatory process, we must trust that God understands what He's doing. God's timing is enigmatic. We'll be extremely frustrated if we start comparing how much time we spend waiting to how much time others spend waiting. Each of our lives has a unique design from God. Esther's purpose was to go before the king and be welcomed rather than dismissed, as well as to request that he be kind to the Jews. Our objectives are different, but we too will need time to attain them effectively. We may need to improve our physical fitness. It's possible that we'll need spiritual development and awareness. It's possible that we'll need to develop emotionally. Whatever we have to accomplish, part of it will be done with other support, but most of it will be done alone. God's perfect timing accomplishes two goals. It strengthens our faith by forcing us to wait and trust Him, and it ensures that He and He alone receives the glory and honor for bringing us through. Psalms 31, 14 to 17. But I trust in you, Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Let me not be put to shame. 
Lord, for I have cried out to you. But let the wicked be put to shame and be silent in the realm of the dead. In this passage, David frequently extols the Lord's goodness to himself and rejoices in the God of his salvation's loving kindness. He keeps track of the numerous times the Lord has seen and replied to the accusations, affliction, and problems that have followed him. And thanks to the Lord his God for putting to fight the foes who covertly set traps for him. Despite his many enemies, the sorrows and weeping that sap his strength, and the malicious machinations that are hatched against him, David is able to say, But as for me, O Lord, I trust in you. You are my God, I exclaim joyfully. I know that you can do anything, and nothing that you plan is impossible. Job 42.2 Job's entire life had crumbled in one day, and he'd become the laughing joke of the neighborhood. And in an attempt to excuse himself, Job begged of the Lord to explain why. Why should this happen to one who trusted in God? His inquiring whispers were, Why should he endure so much? But following his contact with the creator of the universe, Job realized that God knows everything and can do everything, and that God must be trusted to stay in command of everything without interference or accusations from people whose grasp of the Lord's profound things is so limited. It was once remarked that the Son of God is shown to us via man's teaching, but the Son of God is revealed in us by the Holy Spirit's illumination. This was the joyful consequence of Job's experience with God. And this is the lesson of confidence and trust that God wants all of his children to understand. God can do anything. God has the right to do anything he wants. And nothing he planned or designs are impossible because he alone is God. Let us live in humble surrender to your spirit's leadership, knowing that there's nothing good in ourselves. Knowing that you can do anything and that nothing you set out to do is impossible. You feel like life can't get any better for you, like you are stuck with certain limits and disabilities that make you inefficient or not match up to others. Do you feel stuck? Like for you, life is over and cannot get better. So you have stopped dreaming aspiring for greatness and just settling for whatever life throws at you. Today, I intend to show you that you can unlock your limits. There's so much waiting for you to manifest, so much that God has invested in you that must not go to waste. It is within your power to unlock your limits, to unlock yourself to an amazing world of possibilities. Romans 8:19 says, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. I stumbled upon the story posted by one member of a popular online forum some time ago. In this story, he shared a personal experience he had which I believe will be quite helpful in helping you understand how to unlock your potentials. His story reads thus. One day a small gap appeared in the cocoon through which the butterfly had to appear. As a small boy who accidentally passed by, I stopped and watched how the butterfly was trying to get out of the cocoon. It took a long time. The butterfly was trying very hard, and the gap was as little as before. It seemed that the power would leave the butterfly soon. As a boy, I decided to help the butterfly. I took a penknife and cut the cocoon. The butterfly immediately got out, but its body was weak and feeble, and the wings were barely moving. I continued to watch the butterfly, thinking that now its wings would spread and it would fly. However, that did not happen. The rest of its life, the butterfly had to drag its weak body and wings that weren't spread. It was unable to fly because I did not realize that an effort to enter through the narrow gap of the cocoon was necessary for the butterfly, so that the life-giving fluid would move from the body to the butterfly's wings, and that the butterfly could fly. Life forced the butterfly to leave its shell hardly so that it would become stronger, would be able to grow and develop. And here was this message from that story. If we were allowed to live without meeting difficulties, we would not be viable. Life gives us challenges to make us stronger. Therefore, every time I am faced with a challenge, I will not let the water sink my ship, but I will always let the water carry me to new destinations. Why is this story so important in this context today? You see, 
After dealing with the butterfly, this person learned a valuable lesson about allowing ourselves to go through everything that life presents us and to break our own limitations. You never know what you are capable of until it is all you have to do. You never know how strong you are until your entire existence and survival lies on being strong. But as long as you keep yourself within the borders of your own limit, you will not be able to maximize your potential. Don't you know that God wants you to maximize your potential? Do you know that because of what He has placed in your life, you cannot remain where you are? Where you are now is the least place you can be. Yes, you can be grateful. Yes, you have to be content with where you have. But then you have to learn not to confuse contentment with complacency. With contentment, you are grateful for where you are while looking forward to where and what you can be. With complacency, on the other hand, you are pleased with how far you have come and you have settled there. You'd rather stay within the comfort of that familiar territory and build your empire there than go out of your way to chart a new course in the unfamiliar territory. The average person likes familiar territory. The average person does not like change. Change is risky. Change is not comfortable. Change is work. But, dear friend, change is good. Change is necessary for growth to happen. Change is worth every risk taken. Is it comfortable? No. Is it worth it? Yes. One of my favorite examples of unlocking your limitations is the story of the Israelites in the wilderness. You see, after they came out of Egypt by the manifestation of God's mighty hand, they began their journey to the promised land. This journey was like the process of the butterfly called metamorphosis. You see, God would use different stages and situations on this journey to transform them from who they were to who He wanted them to be before they stepped into the Promised Land. They had left Egypt as lifelong slaves, and their minds were programmed to respond only one way. Slavery, bondage, fear, timidity, and low self-esteem. God was going to use this journey to rid them of it by empowering them to win their battles and thereby reinstalling a victorious mindset in them instead. So, that when they entered the Promised Land, they would be marching in as triumphant and not as timid slaves. Well, one of those stages as God led them from one point to another. They arrived at Horeb, frequently called the Mountain of God. This was where God gave them the Ten Commandments and where He renewed His covenant with the entire nation again. It was still in the desert, but there they had enough sustenance. Mount Horeb is a symbol of a point of spiritual achievement through suffering. It is a place of protection and rest in the midst of chaos and dryness all around. At Horeb, you think you have tried enough because there you feel closer to God. There you feel you have everything you need, proximity to divinity, provision and protection. There you feel you have found rest finally, no pressure. Here, you have control over what comes and over what goes. Here you have measured the responsibilities and can handle them all without breaking a sweat. Here there is no chaos, it's serene, and no intruder dares you there because you are somewhat established. Yet Horeb, as great as it is, is not your promised land. The children of Israel reached this point and settled too. However, God would not have it, and He told them it was time to get back on the road. This was not as best for them yet. Deuteronomy 1, 6 through 8 narrates what God told them. The Lord our God said to us at Horeb, You have stayed long enough at this mountain. Break camp and advance into the hill country of the Amorites. Go to all the neighboring peoples of the Arabah, in the mountains, in the western foothills, in the Negev and along the coast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the Euphrates. See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land the Lord swore He would give to your father, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. Why settle in the comfort of the wilderness when I have prepared the entire country for you? You may not accept this, but you should. Sometimes God rocks your boat so that you don't get too comfortable unless when you should move on to much more. There is a time to pitch in tent, and there is a time and place to build a castle. Don't confuse the two. Remember the plan in Jeremiah 29:11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. 
plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That plan hasn't changed one bit. Is it going to be hard? Yes, honestly speaking, it will. However, that is where faith comes in. You see, the Bible says that the just shall live by his faith. For every child of God, our Father wants us to live a life that is constantly trusting in his ability. He doesn't want us to come to the place where we do not have any need to trust him for anything. Here is the reason he places big visions in seemingly small people, beautiful dreams in people with ugly lives, great stories in the lives of those known for failure. He wants you to trust him. Why do you have to trust him? Because if God helps you, you cannot but win. Isaiah 41, 10, 13 through 14 reads, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand, for I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, you worm, Jacob. Little Israel, do not fear, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. What he says to Israel, he speaks to you today. Will you trust him? What is that dream you have seen? Don't throw it away. What is the thing that looks like a handicap in your life right now? Have you thought that maybe God allowed it in your life to make your story more notable? Think about this. If a regular person did the things Helen Keller did, they might have been applauded and maybe forgotten later. Yet for someone like Helen, with her disabilities, it was noteworthy. Today, we still read and hear so much about the woman who, though was blind in death, died a successful author, disability rights advocate, political activist, and lecturer. A feat that many complete and able people never reach in their lifetime. Let me tell you, the uglier the mess in your life, the more notable your success story. Will you dare trust God with that ugliness? It is time to open your bag of limitations and let it all out. Maybe you think that you are alone in all of these. Maybe your environment and experiences have programmed your mind to believe that you cannot reach those visions. That is a lie. You are not alone. You've got God on your side, and He is all that you need to reach your goals. Matthew 19, 26 says, Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Many things are impossible with man, but nothing is impossible with God. Absolutely nothing. With God, all things are possible. With Him, you can make it. With God, you can stand. With God, you can. You can. You can. Like our opening story, don't look for an easy way out of your cocoon. Go through it. The harder the challenge, the stronger you will be. The tougher the storm the greater your testimony will be. Don't just get off the bus yet. Lay it before God. Let God carry you through the tide. Let God lead the vision he has put in your heart. Then as you keep moving one step at a time towards what you have seen, with your eyes on God, you will see the impossible turning into possibilities. If you will believe, Jesus said, all things are possible to the person who believes. Dear friend, go on. Unlock your limitations. You can't remain like this anymore. There is a space for you in the next level. Climb up higher. You can do this. God has your back. What are you focused on? Have you ever thought about it? It is a fact that a lot of things are calling for your attention in life. But what you focus on is your decision. Among so many things that you are exposed to, it is your choice which of them you respond to. But perhaps the wisest thing for you to do is to focus on God, the very source of life. When you do this, He will give you the proper perspective on everything. It clearly says in John 1.5, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. God is one with His Word, meaning that His Word is the light. Therefore, you focus on God by constantly dwelling on His Word. 
His Word gives you the true definition and explanation of everything. Life is demystified for the Christian who dwells on God's Word. This is so important because from the beginning, God never wanted man to walk in darkness. God, who is light, could not have made man in his own image and placed him in darkness. This was why he put a light in a place before he made man. Darkness signifies confusion, uncertainty, chaos, crisis, fear, evil, death, etc. Whatever is outside God, you don't need it. It will only get you into trouble. Adam and Eve were getting along well with themselves and God until the serpent came. Before this, God had given Adam his mandate and told him how to conduct himself. Adam and Eve did not need anything outside God to fulfill his purpose. But Eve fell for the serpent's bait and got Adam involved. Much of our troubles as Christians today are traceable to a lack of light in our hearts or a failure to apply it. And when we have not received the light, which is God's word, we are likely to seek answers outside of it. This is the realm of darkness. But the Bible charges in the book of Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace into your hearts to the Lord. When you learn to focus on God, you will not be weighed down by the issues of life. God, through his word, teaches you all things and fills you with wisdom for life. No wonder it says that. And ye are complete within him, which is the head of all principality and power. Colossians 2.10 no matter the challenges you are facing now, do not let them break your focus on God. This is their intent, to turn you from God in search of solutions. In Chronicles 16, the Bible shows the account of Asa, king of Judah, whose reign began to witness decline when he sought help from men rather than God at a time of war and when he feet got diseased. Settle it in your mind that God has all the answers to the issues before you, and nothing can make him by surprise. Jesus Christ, speaking in the book of Matthew 6.33, said, But seek ye first in the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God brought you into his wisdom. God brought you into his kingdom through Jesus Christ. He did not save you for yourself. You need to learn how his kingdom functions and what your role is. As you do this, God will take care of every issue in your life, one after the other. As you cooperate with him in expanding his kingdom on earth through the gospel, he will meet your needs. God's priority is to have all men saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Partner with him in this regard and let him take responsibility for your life. Do not wait until you have the time. Create it. Do wait till you have a lot of money. Start using what you have. God is a multiplier and he is looking for men and women that he can trust. With opportunities, platforms, and wealth, do not lose sight of God in pursuit of anything. Approach everything with the light of God. If you try to run your life all by yourself, you will be drained and frustrated. You will be faced with challenges that only God can take care of. God wants you to depend totally on Him so that you can stay refreshed at all times. God has the power to do many things in different places all at once. Without being overwhelmed, He is not a man, but a spirit. Jesus Christ speaking in the book of Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Stay in constant fellowship with God, and you will not struggle, because his wisdom will be evident in all you do. As a believer in Jesus Christ, 
you have the life and nature of God in you. This means that you have the capacity to function like God and get his kind of results. In this way, nothing you do fails because you are one spirit with him. Even when you pray, do not spend too much time asking God for things. Concentrate on ministering to him in thanksgiving, worship, and praises. Believe that he always knows what to do. It is during such times that you will have visions and receive clear guidance. In answer to prayers, and sometimes it will not be your own prayer. It was while he was praying that God gave Peter a vision to reach out to Cornelius the Gentile with the gospel. God can give you a vision for your family, your business, and your community, but your heart must be open to him. You can admire what God is doing in the lives of other men and women, but if you focus on him, he will show you what to do with your own life. He has a blueprint for your destiny, but you must not be in a hurry. Moses the prophet spent 40 days on Mount Sinai with God where he summoned to receive the Ten Commandments for the nation of Israel. God loves to test and train men before he commits valuable things to them. Focus is a major ingredient for success in any endeavor. You must be able to recognize and avoid distractions. There are activities that drain your time and energy, but they are not important. A lot of people are failing because they have not learned to prioritize their activities. The first thing for you to do each morning is to pray and meditate on the Word of God. This is where you receive wisdom for a fruitful day. Make a decision that your television and radio should be switched off at this time. It shows how important such moments are to you. Your phone also should be on flight mode. Let people around you know how special such times are to you. Even when you are done praying, keep your mind on God. God will keep you in peace when your mind is on Him. You will confidently get into the day's program knowing that everything will turn out well, no matter how good your plans are. Without the hand of God, you will struggle to see them fulfilled. What God does is help you deal with any emergencies capable of making you derail. You must realize that your plans are not as perfect as you think. As you walk with God, He will go beyond your plans and do you good. Be willing to allow Him to modify those plans so that he, they can align with His. Divine guidance is superior to your plans, no matter how detailed they are. If God is leading you to abandon your plans totally, then cooperate with Him for your own good. His ways are always higher than yours. And what really matters to you are not the plans themselves, but getting results through them. In walking with God, one of his attributes you should take note of is he is dynamic. What he will tell you to do in a particular situation now may not be the same thing he will tell you to do if a similar situation arises in the future. The Israelites needed what to drink in the wilderness. So God instructed Moses to strike the rock of Horeb. When Moses obeyed, water came out and the people drank. But another time, when Israel needed water, God told Moses to speak to the rock this time around. Moses struck the rock again and water came out. But God was displeased. You must trust God enough to obey the new instruction, even when it does not make any sense to you. What worked yesterday may not be acceptable today. Do not seek new ways by yourself. Let it come from God. God can speak through circumstance or during a conversation. It does not have to be spectacular. Sometimes we jump out of our house and go about looking for money. It is a big mistake to seek God first before things because you will find it difficult to hear him when your mind is not on him. The voice of God can save you money and can even save your life because God knows what is ahead. All that glitters is not gold. So wake up early enough to seek God above everything else. Succeeding is not about how many places you went or how many things you are doing. You are not competing with anyone but yourself. If you were ignorant of what I have been sharing, 
there is no need for any regrets. Just start putting them to work so that your future can be better. Be very patient with yourself because it takes some time to get used to it. As they say, Rome was not built in a day. Be very determined to do it. If you make mistakes, do not beat yourself. Be encouraged and keep at it. It takes tenacity to adopt a new routine. Your family and those around you will need to adjust to it. But your life will certainly be more productive. Look around you and make inquiry. All successful people have a daily routine that their lives follow in accordance with, with their pursuit. Business, academics, arts, sports, etc. Nobody stumbles into true success. It is always traceable to deliberate steps practiced over a period of time. It is hard, but smart work. It involves continuous unlearning and relearning. Knowledge needs to be reviewed and updated when necessary because what you knew five years ago may have become obsolete today. Be very current in your field. You are growing even if the results are not yet visible. Just stay on track.